Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Sunday morning, Chicago. Always a pleasure. And, and what better topic for a Sunday morning than the future of our residential securitization environment? And, and actually, we're very happy to be here. As you know, this is a joint session of the AFA and Aruya. Uh, obviously, a, a critically important topic. And, and to our uh, great pleasure and all the rest, we have a very distinguished group of people up here at the podium. People who are deep, who kind of live this every day of the week. People are, who have been or are currently in significant government service, uh, work at the GSEs, whatever. So we're looking, at it, looking forward to a very good panel. Uh, the way this is going to work is I'm going to say a couple of words of introduction. From there, we're going to go to uh, presentations by each of the panelists, and each of the panelists will have a few minutes to share their thoughts on the overarching theme of our get-together this morning. And from there, we will go to some q and I'm going to set the stage with respect to some Q&A, and we'll also uh, go to your questions. And we will look forward to that, and we will hope that the time permits for all of that. So with no further ado, just a couple of words, firstly, with respect to setting, and I don't think that there's anything on this particular slide that's not well known to people in this room. We're now five years into what can only be described as an epic housing downturn, and one that shows only really preliminary signs of abating. If you look at this in terms of the metric of house prices, we know that house prices once argued never to uh, decline on a national basis have declined by about a third. In parts of the country, they've declined by 60 or 70 percent. And in many metropolitan areas, we're still expecting house prices to drift down, given the overhang of foreclosure and all the rest. Home construction is running at about one-third of long-run equilibrium levels and at about one-fourth of peak levels. And the home ownership rate, which in and of itself moved up to an excess of 69 percent, is now down to levels uh, recorded in the late 1990s and according to work that we've done recently, is anticipated to go further south. So in terms of the real side housing indicators, we, we know the story. And with respect to the housing finance system, I think we know the story as well. And the story is an implosion of the system, or at least the implosion of the private mortgage finance system. And we're talking here of primary, secondary, and derivative uh, tertiary markets. So that essentially some 95% of everything that we do with respect to mortgages in this country or more, and Frank will have some summary statistics for us momentarily, is in the hands of the U.S. government. Of course, there remains significant controversy with respect to the GSEs. Their political status is in limbo. They remain in government conservatorship, and they've cost the U.S. taxpayer uh, very significant amounts of money, maybe $150 billion, maybe more. Okay, now, as you well appreciate, uh, there's been uh, indictment of the GSEs from many different quarters, and that indictment, indictment relates to uh, all kinds of aspects of GSE behavior. For, firstly, this idea that the GSEs actually may have been destabilizing in the influence of the market. One of the points that's made here is that they, they may uh, indeed have exacerbated the subprime boom. And the point that's noted here is the fact that the GSEs, of course, loaded up with respect to subprime MBS. They were significant purchasers of subprime MBS, and they held significant uh, amounts of subprime MBS. The point to be made, however, is that uh, the GSEs purchased subprime uh, because they were counted, or, or at least in part because they were counted uh, towards their affordable housing goals. And they purchased subprime with uh, 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 the full knowledge of, of the regulator, the Federal Housing Fi Finance Agency. So that uh, uh, government influence here has to be taken into account as well. And speaking of the affordable housing loan programs, uh, there's research that we've undertaken that suggests that these GSC affordable housing loan purchase programs were more or less ineffectual in achievement of the overarching goal, where the overarching goal was home ownership. But uh, uh, that having been said, I'm not sure if this is good news or bad. And indeed, um, it, it, it kind of depends here. It's, it's hard to blame the GSC affordable housing loan purchase programs for the boom and the bust in home ownership if indeed they were ineffectual. Uh, of course, there's uh, fairly significant evidence with respect to GSC crowd out of private mortgage purchase activity. Uh, in the analysis that we undertook, the crowd out coefficient at peak was about 50%. And, and we have a time series of those crowd out coefficients. And of course, research that Wayne did quite a while back and other research that's been undertaken suggests that only uh, a portion, maybe half of the GSE funding advantage, 
was passed to the consumer in the form of lower rates. Now, the interesting part is as, as the boom turned to bust, as I mentioned previously, the entirety of our private origination and securitization system fell away. We're left only with what, what uh, was in the hands of the US government. I've spoken of that previously. Uh, the crowd out disappeared entirely, so that the crowd out coefficients that we were measuring fell from 50% really to zero, or even potentially to crowd in. And interestingly enough, we have kind of potentially a peak of the future, to the extent that the, the future involves some sort of an explicit US government credit guarantor, in the sense that the GSCs in conservatorship with an explicit guarantee remain robust in their securitization of mortgages to the tune of maybe something like $300 billion per quarter. So very significant GSC provision of liquidity. And without this liquidity, uh, arguably things would have been uh, far worse. So what we find is that the GSCs now, essentially as a public agency, in public conservatorship and the like, have become an important instrument of macroeconomic and housing market stabilization. Monetary policy also played a role, obviously, and the Fed, at least in my day at the Fed, would never publicly uh, target the housing sector. The Fed is publicly targeting the housing sector today, and they're doing that, and they have done that for some time. They've do, they're working most recently largely via long-term interest rates, obviously through the quantitative easing programs, through Operation Twist, through their very extensive purchase of, of GOC MBS, and you've, you've heard the news of recent days with, with respect to the Federal Reserve White Paper as well. So, we come to the topic of the session, having laid some groundwork then. Moving forward, the first question, and a question that we don't usually talk about, we talk around this question, but I, I'd be really uh, very pleased if the panelists would, would find the opportunity to address this question. What, normatively, what should be the role of the federal government in support of housing? And in particular, as we're all very well aware, we have this overarching, overwhelming uh, pro-homeownership bias in our US government housing policy and in our housing policy regulation and all the rest. And the question is, uh, it, it seems to me that we are implicitly rebalancing tenure bias in this country. The question is, are we prepared to stand up and say that we are explicitly now rebalancing tenure bias. I'd be interested in an opinion on that. We also, with respect to our secondary market support and our focus on mortgage finance more generally, have focused a lot on liquidity, perhaps to the detriment of stability of the funding system and the ability of the funding system to provide residential mortgages at a reasonable cost, cutting through uh, these cyclical fluctuations, uh, cutting through good times and bad. I know that, that David will, will speak some to this point. Another point here is, and, and I think the panelists would agree with this next point, is that when we, we sort of look backwards as opposed to forwards, we, we really do view the conflation of, of the social and the private mission of the GSEs uh, historically as having not worked and having been harmful in many respects. And so Dwight, uh, in his writing, and many others argue that whatever remains of the affordable housing goals should be put explicitly into a redistributive agency, should be put into the FHA or into the VA. And there, then finally there's a question of, of the time frame and the nature and the extent of which we transition from the current GSC model. All of our panelists have, have ideas about this. Their ideas differ very significantly. We're going to look forward to their ideas. One question is, uh, there's a question politically, of course, as to whether we're going to pull the plug any time in the future. And that question is different from an economic question. Uh, I suspect that the answer to the first question, the political question, is there's, there's little prospect of pulling the plug any time in the future. Dwight has argued in his work and in his recent papers that uh, pulling the plug sooner as opposed to later is not a bad idea. And the question here is, is whether... Uh, uh, liquidity impairment associated with pulling the plug is, is pertinent. Um, we can talk more about that. Finally, the, the kind of biggest question in front of us today, and I know all of the panelists will speak to this question, is does the future here in the United States uh, uh, hold uh, an explicitly backed uh, mortgage credit guarantor? Uh, and, and if so, what form that credit guarantor will, will play? One of, the, one of the arguments that Wayne and Diana and others have made is that the government's role should be narrowed, narrowed very substantially to a very subordinated loss position, uh, uh, such that 
uh, there would be uh, others, borrowers, lenders, PMI, et cetera, that would come into play in very low L LTV mortgages and all the rest. Other questions that pertain here are the question of port portfolio holding with respect to the explicitly backed credit guarantor, the nature of the mortgage product. Most analysts argue for a, a safe or even super safe, low LTV, homogeneous mortgage product. David has written about the, the nature of the pricing of the explicit guarantee uh, and risk premium that would be associated with that explicit guarantee. So these are questions, these are topics that are uh, part of our conversation this morning. And, and I, I'm going to sit down now. We have just a terrific panel. And we're going to start off with Frank Notaft, who's chief economist at Freddie Mac. And Frank's going to help to set the stage. And we're going to go on from there in alphabetical order. And you're going to hear some very interesting views about the future of residential mortgage securitization. Stuart, do you know how to set this thing up? Answer to the question, how many economists does it take to open a PowerPoint file? Uh, th thank you so much, Stuart, for uh, organizing the panel. And it's certainly my pleasure to be here to share with you some, uh, some thoughts about the future of residential mortgage securitization. Uh, this is, these are the points I'll cover in my remarks this morning. Just an overview of the residential mortgage market and the securitization process, and then just some information about MBS issuance over uh, the last 25 years, MBS issuance then and now, and I'll sh then uh, share some information about uh, mortgage uh, default by a loan product, and then uh, talk about the TBA or to be announced market, which I think is a very important uh, component of the mortgage securitization uh, market right now and something that I think has a lot of value to be preserved in whatever the future uh, securitization um, market looks like. And then share with you some thoughts on what I think MBS investors uh, want or need to have. But first, uh, a bit of a very brief high-level overview of the uh, residential mortgage market. And as you know, there's a primary market, which is to the left of the slide, and a secondary market to the right-hand side of the slide. The primary market is the market where borrowers go to lenders to obtain a mortgage loan, typically banks, uh, savings institutions, credit unions, uh, mortgage companies uh, to obtain the mortgage loan. And sometimes depositories will hold the loan in their own portfolio. Other times they'll sell off the loan, and of course mortgage bankers tend to send off all, sell off all their loans. So then they act as a, the servicer. Uh, for the ultimate investor in the secondary market who has acquired the loan. The borrower typically uh, has direct contact with that servicer. They make their monthly payments every single month to the servicer. And it's very common or typical that the borrower is a bit removed and may not even know who the ultimate secondary market investor is in the loan. Uh, the secondary market is composed of uh, Ginnie Mae, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and um, private label securities as well, even though the private label security uh, market is um, fairly dormant uh, over the last few years. Uh, sir, the originator of the loan can package FHA VA loans into a Ginny May pool and then issue a Ginny May guaranteed uh, mortgage-backed security into the capital markets. Or the loan could be sold to Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae then could either hold the loan in its retained portfolio or issue a mortgage-backed security. Or the loan could be sold to uh, the private label security market through private conduits. And then in turn, the securities get traded through the broker-dealer uh, uh, network, and the ultimate investor in the mortgage-backed securities could be depository institutions, life and life insurance companies, or a variety of other investors. So again, very high-level overview of the operation of the mortgage market in the US. I think it's helpful to um, 
compare, just look at some uh, statistics about the size of the residential mortgage market uh, and maybe help address the question about, well, can we go back to the model of 60, 70 years ago where mortgages were typically uh, originated and held in portfolio, typically by lending institutions? I think there's an important need for securitization going forward. We do need a, um, a residential mortgage securitization market in the future. Uh, in large part to attract additional investors and capital to finance residential mortgages in the U.S. Just a couple of uh, real simple facts. Cur currently, there's about $11 trillion in the single-family, multifamily mortgage debt outstanding in the U.S. If you add up all the deposits, uh, all the depository institutions, the banks, savings institutions, credit unions, you get about $9 trillion. And yet the depositories are also uh, financing a whole variety of other types of loans and credit needs in the economy, including non-residential mortgages, including uh, acquisition development, construction loans, ADC lending, uh, commercial, industrial, and other types of business loans, a whole variety of non-mortgage consumer credit, such as automobile loans and credit cards and whatnot, and then also providing finance to governments, whether it's state, local, or international. So there's a lot of demands for the funds uh, in the depositories. So to me, you still need to have securitization going forward uh, in order to bring the additional capital in to help meet the financing needs of uh, uh, the America, America's housing stock. In terms of the overall fixed income uh, market, uh, mortgage-backed securities represent Almost a, almost a quarter of all the fixed income securities uh, out in the marketplace. So another quarter or so is U.S. Treasury debt, another almost a quarter is corporate debt and various other types of uh, debt. Uh, but mortgage-backed securities represent an important component of the overall fixed income market. Now we can take out that slice that represents mortgage-backed securities and do a deeper dive to take a look and what the investor profile looks like in mortgage-backed securities. So let's do that. So there's roughly uh, $6.3 trillion in uh, uh, residential mortgage-backed securities outstanding. And we can take a look at what, how the uh, ownership distribution looks. Uh, roughly a quarter of all the mortgage-backed securities are held by depository institutions. That's the kind of the light blue slice. And as uh, Stuart mentioned in his opening remarks, the federal government is also playing a large role as an investor in mortgage-backed securities, a relatively new role, one that's evolved over the last two and a half years. Uh, some of it is held by the U.S. Treasury, but the overwhelming uh, part of it is held by the, uh, the Federal Reserve System, the New York Federal Reserve Bank. And there are other investors, too. There's a chunk that's still held by foreign investors. Uh, about 11% or so is held by Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae directly in their portfolios. And then there are other investors, life insurance companies, mutual funds, pension funds, and other investors that round out the picture of the investor base in uh, mortgage-backed securities. I'd like to turn now and take a look at uh, just some information about uh, issuance of mortgage-backed securities over the last uh, 10, 20 years. This shows the volume of issuance by year over, since 2000 to current. And each bar represents uh, different uh, parts of the, of the issuance. So the dark blue uh, base of each bar is the amount of mortgage-backed securities issued by Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. The um, piece right above that, which on my laptop looks orange, I'm not quite sure what color that is, but, uh, but it's supposed to be orangey. Uh, that's Ginnie Mae guaranteed securities. And again, Ginnie Mae just guarantees pools of FHA and VA loans. And then the multicolors above that are different flavors of private label securities, reflecting the type of collateral behind the private label securities. So right above the orange, the kind of that light blue sliver, is jumbo loans made to prime credit borrowers. 
And above that, in the multi-layering of colors, represent non-traditional uh, mortgage loans, such as uh, all to A, or otherwise uh, low doc, no doc lending, subprime loans, and second liens, securitization of second liens. Now you can see early on in the decade, if, even if we just focus on the upper tip, which is the private label securities, at least half of the private label securities early on were prime jumbo loans, the light blue piece. But there's really a sea change after about 2003. After 2003, private label security issuance expands substantially. Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, and Ginnie Mae guaranteed issuance declines. And if you look within the private label space, you see the light blue sliver, the jumbo loans, the prime credits, is a small part of that overall upper layer. And so what we see is a big increase in the volume of subprime, no doc, low doc lending, second lien lending, that securitized place in the private label securities. The next big change is after 2007, of course, after the implosion of the private label securities market in the US. And there's basically been a dearth of issuance of private label securities since then. And as Stuart pointed out, there's still a fair amount of issuance of Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, and Ginnie Mae Garrett pools uh, since then. And in fact, Ginnie Mae uh, activity is the largest of the entire decade over just the last few years, representing the important role, in particular, that FHA is playing in the primary market. The last couple of years, about half of all the home purchase mortgages in the country are insured by the FHA. It's a very important part of promoting home purchases uh, in the US. So that's the level of issuance, but we can take a look over a little longer time period at share of MBS issuance. So let's do that. So this is the market share percent of all MBS issuance. And to simplify it, I just grouped it into three classes of, of uh, securities. The, light, uh, the blue curve at the top is Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae added together. The green curve in the middle is uh, Ginnie Mae securities. And the red curve is private label securities. And again, it's percent of issuance, so you add the three curves, you get to 100%. You can see how it's changed over the last 25 years. The, um, um, there was a, a C, as I mentioned earlier, a big sea change in 2004 when subprime and non-traditional lending became very prominent across the United States. Uh, big declines in uh, Freddie Fannie, Ginnie Mae, security, share of overall issuance. And for the first time, private label securities represented over half of all the new mortgage-backed securities issued in the US in 04, 05, 06, first part of 07, until the implosion of the private label securities market. Now we've returned to a pattern that's much more rem reminiscent of what it was like back in the mid to late 1980s. I want to turn now and just uh, talk very quickly about um, mortgage loan performance. Let's start first with uh, what I think of as a, one of the lower risk products in the marketplace, namely conventional loans made the prime credits. And we can take a look using data from the Mortgage Bankers Association from the National Delinquency Survey on what the serious delinquency rate has been for those loans over a long period of time. And the, and the bands, those gray bands, are periods of economic macro recession. So we've had several recessions over the last 50 years or so. And uh, you can, and typically delinquency rates rise, default rates rise during a recession. And you can see what we've gone through in the most recent housing downturn is unlike anything else we've seen in the post-World War II period. You really gotta go back to the 1930s to see the last time that default rates on single family loans were at the levels that we're seeing right now. As I mentioned, this is the, what I think of as some of the safer, a lower risk products. So let's now compare this with default rates on other products and be mindful of the vertical axis because things are gonna change here a bit. So the vertical axis you see goes from zero to seven and a half percent. So now my axis goes from zero to 44%. Okay, it's the same uh, statistic, serious delinquency rate, but to get subprime and 
the no doc loans on there, I had to really stretch the vertical axis. So uh, the green curves at the top are subprime adjustable rate and subprime fixed rate. Then the blue curve right below that is conventional arms to prime credits, including no doc and low doc loans. Uh, the red curve below that's FHA VA, and the curve below that is prime conventional fixed rate mortgages, which tend to remain the lowest uh, risk product in the marketplace, although the fault rates have also risen sharply for that product compared to history. And just for fun, I thought I'd put Freddie Mac's portfolio statistics too. And so the lowest line there is the serious delinquency rate, the same statistic for Freddie Mac's uh, portfolio as well. Uh, of a large investor in um, single family mortgages, Freddie Mac actually has the lowest serious delinquency rate of, of any of the large investors in single family mortgages. Um, I want to turn now and talk a bit about the TBA market, which I think is a very important uh, component of today's uh, Secure uh, MBS market is something that I think is very important to preserve in whatever the future looks like for the MBA, uh, MBS market. It's the cornerstone of the mortgage market. It's highly liquid, easily tradable. It's uh, for fixed rate products, 30, 15, and 20 year product. And just for um, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, and Ginnie Mae securities. Trades occur with very few components known to the trading parties when they enter into the trade agreement. The terms that are known are the dollar amount, term, the type of issuer, whether it's a Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, or Ginnie Mae security, the coupon, and the settlement date. And the reason that the, the market is successful and trades are consummated is because there's a very specific set of policies and disclosure that are required. And it's uh, policed uh, in some sense by uh, an industry trade group, um, the securities industry uh, and financial market association, SIFMA. Um, so again, some important components of the market is that uh, it's for Ginnie Mae, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac securities and um, uh, through various trading conventions, eligible securities trade without counter counterparties initially, knowing which exact pools or QSIPs will, uh, will trade. So uh, I'm getting short on time here, so I just want to close with uh, some uh, thoughts about the future of uh, securitization in the marketplace. And I think one interesting question is whether or not securitization will separate from credit insurance. And uh, one can make uh, argue either side of the, of the point, uh, and there are pros and cons to each one. So combining the credit insurance and securitization functions together aligns the incentives of the insurer and the securitizer by integrating credit and prepayment risk management. Alternatively, separating the two functions allows for many credit insurers and consequent dispersion of credit risk while perhaps allowing for a fewer number of securitizers, which may be important for uh, uh, promoting liquidity and uh, perhaps a TBA market in the future. And finally, what do investors ultimately need and want? Because that's what you want to meet in order to uh, have a very active liquid secondary market in the future. These investors will want a highly liquid market, easily discovered pricing, access to underlying data and analysis, access to applicable rules and policies such as are in place now through, uh, through SIFMA, and understandable and predict predictable performance. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you uh, very much, Frank, and I'd like to introduce Professor Dwight Jaffe from the University of California at Berkeley, who is our, our next panelist. Very good, terrific. Uh, 
Uh, my prepared comments are actually very much focused on the topic, uh, future of securitization. I noticed that Stuart in his introduction uh, expanded the uh, uh, topics to GSEs and the role of government and uh, the current market conditions. And I have lots to say on all of those topics, but I'll save them for the uh, Q&A. The, the first point I want to make is that the um, reason that, that the future of securitization is a topic at all of interest, I believe, is that there, in, in certain circles it's been accused of being a primary source of the crisis. And the first points I want to make is I think that's ver a very misguided conclusion and that, in fact, some of these accusations have come from banking regulators and I would say they should have looked closer at home because I would say that a primary source of the crisis is actually a failure of banking regulation, not of securitization. And let me make a few comments about that. Uh, say around 2004 when we're just starting the boom period I think everybody I would include myself was very sanguine about uh, how well we now had banking regulation in place uh, uh, following the SNL crisis we had uh, passed legislation uh, that of prompt corrective action that required the regulators to basically close banks prompt, promptly if they uh, uh, reached any sort of insufficient capital status uh, we had encouraged banks to issue subordinated debt uh, with the idea that the bondholders would feel also at risk and therefore would use their good uh, offices uh, to uh, have uh, market oversight of the risk taking of banks. Uh, and we had the Basel capital requirements with this basically an 8% uh, risk adjusted capital requirement and we all thought it was going to work just very well. Uh, as we know, in fact, it all failed and really failed abysmally. Uh, the worst part, I think, was prompt corrective action sort of immediately disappeared uh, under the uh, force of too big to fail banks, and that's where all the bank bailouts came. Uh, subordinated debt, uh, the bondholders, I think, actually recognized very early that too big to fail protected them, and so they had no interest in, in or concern about the uh, um, uh, risk taking of the banks in which they had invested. And indeed, uh, they were all bailed out completely, 100% on the dollar. And then finally, the capital requirements clearly proved to be inadequate, uh, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more exactly how and why that happened. Uh, now, one counter to what I just said, of course, is to say, well, yes, but it's still approximately a trillion dollars of subprime mortgages uh, uh, have failed, and isn't that a core part of the, uh, of the crisis? And, of course, it is in a sense of, of the mortgage market had a failure, again, not necessarily securitization, but I'd also point out that a trillion dollars of mortgage losses in a what I'd say as of 2006 we had 75 trillion dollars of net household wealth in the United States so the loss ratio the total loss this is to date basically is going to be a cumulative 1.3 percent of, of the household wealth in the United States and I think most people would agree that that's nowhere near enough to sink the US banking system or the financial markets indeed we have days on the New York Stock Exchange where that that kind of a hit to national wealth occurs and of course nothing we move on in the next day it gets reversed. What explains the crisis is not the mortgage losses per se, but how concentrated the losses were inside the banking industry, and that's why I'm saying that the um, uh, 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 banking regulation has to be considered a primary source of the problem. They allow this concentration to occur. And finally, just and it's a, a theme I'm going to repeat again, but let me say here that mortgage-backed securitization should have been a solution to this. Obviously, the core idea of mortgage-backed securitization is to distribute mortgage risks outside of the bank banking system, and I, I, I'm going to conclude it still works and it still should be used, and I hope the future uh, for it will be equally bright. I mentioned the capital requirements, and let me just make one comment here. The standard Basel capital requirements treat whole mortgages that are held in a bank as having a risk weight of 0.5, which basically means the Basel folks treated these as double B or triple B risks, which I think in, in sort of normal mortgages uh, was quite appropriate. In 2000, the, regu the U.S. regulators took a, a, uh, a step, and they all agreed, they had a uniform letter that went out, saying that we're now going to give special dispensation to mortgage-backed securitization, in fact, any kind of securitization, so that if you are a bank and you hold a triple-A or double-A tranche of, an, of, a, of a securitization, your risk weighting is only 0.2. And in fact, if you hold an A tranche, it's still only 0.5, and then so on down through the letters. Um, this gave a strong encouragement to the banks to hold mortgage-backed securities. There was, a, there was a, in effect, a regulatory arbitrage that was created. Now, bank regulators might say, well, nothing wrong with this, 
uh, we were assuming that the rating agencies knew what they were doing and that a AAA or a AA was right. I, my position would be if I were a banking regulator who was writing this in the law, I would take it upon my responsibility to make sure that the rating agencies were doing something right. And if they weren't, that's my, my watch. So again, I'm saying it's, it's not securitization per se, it's how it was used within the banking system and within the banking regulatory system. Okay, so that's preface. Um, to turn to the uh, uh, main theme here is we've, of course, had one major piece of legislation now concerning the mortgage market, and it really comes in two pieces, and I want to separate these two. Uh, Title IX of the, uh, 14 of the Dodd-Frank Act uh, is what I would call m m mortgage market microstructure, uh, and it has to do with new rules of, that we won't have, allow predatory lending. We're going to really look carefully at the mortgage servicers. We're going to not allow the appraisers to cheat. We're going to have uh, a GAO study for closure, uh, for, for closure scams and the like. And I just want to be on the record, I completely endorse all of this. Uh, and in fact, I think it's actually already in place because in July of 2008, the Federal Reserve made a very important expansion of the Truth in Lending Act, which basically said never again in this country can we have a, uh, a, 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 a subprime mortgage uh, a crisis of the sort we had. And basically what the Fed's act did is it's, it, it required that mortgage lenders making high-risk mortgages have to verify that the loan is suitable for, for borrowers. And of course, if, it's not, if, it's, if the loan later fails and it turns out not to be suitable, that lender is going to be at risk uh, to lawsuits. So I, this is a done deal. The, 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 the part of the rest of the talk is going to really be focused on what's under Title IX, Paragraph D of uh, Dodd-Frank, which imposes a 5% uh, securitization risk retention rule on banks. And it basically says to banks, we, we're really worried about your using securitization, and we're going to impose, in effect, a tax saying if you make a mortgage-backed securitization, you cannot transfer 100 percent of it off your balance sheet. You've got to keep 5 percent of it. And, and I'm going to talk a lot more about that. Where does this come from? Why, why did Dodd-Frank do it? Well, this is a quote here from Sheila Baer. I, you, you may or may not be able to read it, but I, the, the sense of it is there's a, that securitization has this chain of transactions starting with the mortgage originator, ending up after five or six tr uh, transactions with the final investors, and that she claims that every stage no one really cares about the quality of the mortgages because they're always going to pass it on to the next person. That's true except at the end of the line. Of course, the in final investor who's holding these mortgages has every reason to scrutinize them. Now, if this final line was uh, mom and pop investors, you might say, well, maybe they're taking advantage of naive investors. But that's not who was buying these. These were the most sophisticated in, uh, sovereign funds, major in, uh, uh, investment banks, and commercial banks around the world. So there was no naivete in the process. And so to say that there was some sort of a moral hazard that f went down the line like this, I think is really uh, uh, misguided. There is also an academic literature that seems to try to provide equal empirical evidence that somehow there was this kind of a moral hazard. And the title in, in one of the earliest and most quoted papers is Lax Underwriting. And I want to say, in my opinion, this is, is a completely misguided interpretation of, of the data. The first point to make is that a lot of the commentators say, well, most subprime mortgages were securitized, uh, ergo, they must have created uh, uh, bad loans. But of course, there's no causes, there's nothing causative in that. And to see that, notice many more prime mortgages were securitized than subprime mortgages. So if you're going to say what was securitized determines the role of securitization, you have to say securitization encouraged high standards. Most of the loans that were securitized were prime. In fact, I, I don't think there is any causative link, but, but it's certainly not that the fact that uh, subprime loans were securitized ha has really no evidence at all. The right way to do it, if you're going to try to do this carefully, would be to take a lender that is both securitizing some loans and holding some loans on portfolio and look very carefully at how they made that choice and, and which loans were going in each direction. There's relatively little data on that, and the few studies that have come to very different uh, 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 conclusions. So the, the data there are, are, are very limited. The, most important paper, and the last comment I'll make here, is on, uh, uses the 620 FICO score as a key factor. And it is true that it's been for many years, it's, it is due to Fannie and Freddie, that a 620 was always considered a benchmark. If your FICO score is above 620, it was assumed to be reasonably good, and the GSEs would securitize it without a lot of question. It would fly through their uh, underwriting machinery. 
Uh, what this paper showed was that the, the, the banks were also making 619 loans and that uh, this raised the question whether they were securitizing uh, uh, bad loans. And of course, the answer was it turned out in, in their own work that the 16, not, 619 and lower loans actually outperformed. And the reason is that there was an underwriting process, and, if, and, and basically 620 was a cutoff. Above it, you didn't have to look very carefully. You just securitized it. Below it, you had to really scrutinize it. And these loans were securitized. People were looking carefully at it. And I would say the underwriting process actually worked very efficiently in that regard. The, the conclusion that people br have brought from, from all of this kind of evidence has been that the, uh, we, we have to control securitization. And even if you bought into the fact that there was some uh, impetus for subprime lending that went through securitization, they're really misinterpreting what is economists would call a market for lemons. And what would go on is, in a, in a market for lemons, both the buyers and the sellers recognize that the product that's being securitized, in this case subprime mortgages, uh, are very low quality. In fact, sensible investors would assume they're the worst quality. Uh, and they get priced appropriately. There's no market inefficiency directly in, in that market. The implication of it is actually quite to the contrary. If you're a bank that has a portfolio of good loans and bad loans, you're going to have to hold the good loans in your portfolio because you won't get a fair price for them if you try to securitize them because the investors are going to assume they're lemons. Um, this is, from a bank regulator standpoint, just what you want. You want the banks holding the good ones and selling the bad ones at fair market prices. So there's really no problem here. So, that, that's sort of where I don't think there is a problem, and, and, and my conclusion at, at this stage is simply that the future of, of mortgage-backed securitization should be unchallenged. It's, that's not the question. The question actually is it's going to turn out, and this does get to the broader questions that, that Stuart already put in the middle into the topic list, is what's going to be the form of that securitization. And the key thing, of course, is that there's going to, there are on the table now three different options for how we might run the new future mortgage-backed securitization uh, market. And I'm really focusing here on the middle market. We, the, the FHA and Ginnie Mae is surely going to continue, in fact, expand anyway. The question is the middle market, which we could call the conforming market because that, that, that's, that's sort of how the data are collected. And there's three options here. You can make it a fully government-guaranteed market, you can make it a full fully private market, or you can come up in some sort of a hybrid form. And uh, this is all chronicled, I would say, in the Treasury White Paper, if you want to see details of these three uh, uh, options, a good place to start is the Feb uh, February 2011 White Paper. My position has been very strong on this. I believe that a private market is the right answer and that it'll work just fine. And the key piece of evidence that I bring to the table as to why a private market will work is that this is exactly what we have in Europe. In fact, Europe for 25 years has had, and it's surprising to some folks to hear, basically private mortgage markets. They have very little government intervention. It's not necessarily that there's such wonderful free market advocates, but the EU rules would view any country that would try to put in government subsidies would be violating the EU regulations. And so they actually, by their self-control, have to have uh, pretty free markets. So an interesting test is how have the U.S. markets compared to the European markets? And the answer is the European markets have steadily outperformed the U.S. markets on a whole bunch of criteria. Our home ownership rate is only eighth out of 16 Western European countries. Our house price volatility, our housing start volatility put us in the upper quarter. Even our mortgage rates are in the top quarter. There is no evidence that all of the government guarantees through the GSEs and all other kinds of forms of government intervention have helped one bit. They've actually hurt. Uh, so what, what would a private mor mortgage market look like? Well, what I'm trying to say quickly in this slide is, is that the changes are not earth shattering. In fact, we have by and large have always had private mortgage markets in the United States. The origination process has always been private. The securitization is ultimately done through private uh, uh, entities. The investors are private ent entity investors. I would comment the GSEs have only held about 10 or 12 percent of all the U.S. mortgages. So if they disappear, you're, you're talking about uh, uh, the market share of private market investors going from 44 to 48, or the banking uh, firms going from 44 to 48. None of these changes are, are, are earth shattering. So it's really a very feasible uh, uh, step. Uh, 
w one thing which probably won't, I'm guessing wouldn't come up on the, on the panel, so I wanted to make a quick comment on it, at least put it on the table, is the question of covered bonds, which of course naturally follows from the European experience. I would place covered bonds as just another form of securitization. Um, it, it, or to put it a little more precisely, it's just another way of getting money from the financial markets, say from Wall Street, to the banks that are originating the mortgages, say Main Street. Uh, covered bonds keep the mortgages on the balance sheet of the bank, but they are sold to uh, the financial markets as a secured, collateralized uh, uh, bond instrument. Securitization does essentially the same thing, except that they're spun off of the balance sheet and put into an SPV. So, and I do believe that covered bonds could become a, a much more active uh, component of U.S. Uh, uh, mortgage markets, and I, as I say, would put that as a form of or a type of uh, securitization. So my conclusions are, are, are simple. I think the, the fundamental benefit of securitization remains completely intact, which is to diversify mortgage risk, get it off of the bank balance sheets and, and into global portfolios, that the effects of securitization moral hazard are exaggerated and misunderstood, and that actually a, a market like that in which the worst mortgages get securitized is exactly what you would want from a bank safety standpoint and that the real bottom line questions are how to run the future mortgage-backed securitization, and I suspect our panel discussion will get into the questions of private markets versus hybrids, et cetera. Thanks. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, we have uh, a very rich set of view views here. We're gonna hear another one now from the leading voice from the Federal Reserve System on these topics, and that's Dr. Wayne Passmore. Well, thank you, Stuart, for the introduction, perhaps an overly generous introduction. Um, uh, and also thank you for uh, inviting me to be on this panel. Uh, so uh, I'm going to discuss some research that my colleague uh, Diana Hancock and I have done on uh, the uh, mortgage-backed securitization market, and um, it has implications for uh, the direction we think the market should go. The main thing I have to do is to be sure I say that the results in this paper uh, are only meant for uh, stimulation, stimulating the discussion and critical comments, and it does not reflect uh, any uh, concurrence by the uh, Board of Governors or anybody else in the Federal Reserve System. So uh, why was more government-sponsored mortgage securitization fragile during the financial crisis? And so to do, uh, understand uh, sort of what happened, you have to understand that the GSEs, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, consisted of sort of two parts, parts that did securitization and then another part that did investment. And it was the part that engaged in the large investment portfolios that ultimately created the failure of the GSEs. Most GSE losses were concentrated with the credit guarantee and not the securities actually held in the portfolio, but it was Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's inability to roll over the debt that caused default. The GSE debt holders ran because, one, credit losses in the portfolio values were opaque and uncertain, and during a time of financial crisis, uh, investors were tending to run. Uh, two, the GSE capitalization was just very small, way, way too low. And three, the GSE debt was unsecure. <clears throat> so if there were no GSE portfolios, that would imply there wouldn't have been a run on the GSE debt. And indeed, the agency MBS holders did not run. The GSEs guaranteed the MBS principal and interest, uh, but it, and when their guarantees come into question, the MBS investors have the underlying collateral. Now, if the capitalization of the GSEs is inadequate to cover a double default by both the GSE and uh, guarantor and by the mortgage uh, collateral itself, the MBS price will fall in the secondary market. But a capital loss is very different than a run, uh, and a run where debt, short-term debt can't be rolled over uh, is something that happens in a very short time frame and requires uh, uh, quick action. So government-sponsored securitization was not fragile during the financial crisis. Now contrast that with private sector mortgage securitization during their most recent financial crisis. Now private market, secur market securitization has been tried many times uh, in the, since the 1880s. And whether you read the history in 1880, whether you read it in 1900s, whether you read it in 1920s up to the Great Depression, uh, 
it's uh, like reading the same story over and over again. There's a credit boom with lax underwriting standards. A shock causes mortgage defaults to rise. Securities holders dump their securities and head for the exits. And securitizers are blamed for fraud and deception. And there's a, a big hunt to uh, determine who was for, to blame for the problem. And the recent crisis was no exception. So why is it that the private sector securitization seems to be uh, fragile? And we would argue that liquidity and fragility are two sides of the same coin. Liquidity is created by securitization because it brings in guarantee-sensitive investors into the market for securities. A guarantee-sensitive investor is an investor who desires an investment that's free of credit risk, but with a yield that is above the yields in sovereign debt. The problem with guarantee-sensitive investors is they'll cut and run at the first sign of trouble. Guarantee-sensitive investors do not engage in due diligence with regard to the underlying collateral uh, of the underlying mortgage-backed security in this case. Uh, such investors are relying on selling the asset quickly on the liquidity of the market, so to speak, their other investors, rather than undertaking due diligence to protect the value of their investments. And the so-called liquidity creates the potential for a significant market disruption if guarantee sets of investors doubt the credit quality of an asset-backed bond. Such liquidity quickly dries up once the guarantee sensitive investors think there's any credit risk in their investment. Um, and as a result, you had two very distinct outcomes for securitization during the financial crisis. Uh, on the panel just showing MBS uh, issuance by the agencies, you can see that securitization remained fairly robust throughout this crisis. On the right, you can see that private market securitization collapsed and has not yet recovered. So the lessons we take from this experience with government-sponsored and private sector mortgage securitization are the following. First, private sector mortgage securitization remains fragile during and after a financial crisis. Second, the government-sponsored guarantees provided liquidity for MBS under all market conditions, including an extreme financial crisis. And third, the result of this is it raises the question of what government institution is needed to provide the insurance that is sold uh, with government-backed, mortgage-backed securitization. Finally, as a subsidiary question is, do you need institutions like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? So we would argue that GSEs are perhaps best perceived as catastrophic mortgage insurers that, uh, that need tighter underwriting standards. So in the private sector, insurance is, this type of insurance, catastrophic insurance, is difficult because it's difficult to match the smooth flow of annual premium receipts with a very highly varying flow of annual payouts. Furthermore, with house prices in particular and financing housing, it's, uh, these insurance payments are hard to diversify because there's this large systemic risk component. Therefore, private insurers cannot offer sufficient guarantees during a crisis, they must cap their losses to survive, and therefore when you combine that with guarantee sensitive investors who run once the assurance of a AAA investment uh, evaporates, you've got the ingredients for a financial panic. The government with its powers of taxation and the ability to repay the MBS holders doesn't um, require, uh, require this capping of the losses. And therefore, uh, they don't rely on the diversification reserves or access to the liquid capital to actually make the securitization market work. Therefore, there are no runs. <clears throat> so we would suggest that one role that one might conceive for the GSEs going far, forward and a way that to maintain mortgage-backed securitiza securitization but greatly increase the private nature of the market is to try to focus them on catastrophic mortgage insurance only. That means the government would bear the tail risk associated with a systemic shock, and it would try to manage this risk like an insurer, uh, and it would, but it would want to mitigate the disruptions during a financial crisis uh, if, uh, if there was a tail risk event. Uh, in our work, we suggest this could be structured a bit like the FDIC, that there's an analogy between this sort of insurance scheme and deposit insurance. For two mortgage-backed instruments, MBS and covered bonds, and uh, we agree with Dwight that covered bonds actually have a great deal of promise in a lot of ways, and we've written that, that um, it is like a very much form of securitization and has some advantages to it, um, that you'd want to insure these, but you still might need catastrophic insurance. This is probably where we disagree with Dwight. Uh, 
uh, that um, you'd have an explicit risk-based insurance premium charged to the mortgage originator. Uh, an insurance reserve fund would be maintained by the entity doing this, similar to the reserve fund backing deposits, insured deposits. And you insure only the most extreme financial disruption, i.e. a, ca a catastrophic risk. Now, in essence, the GSEs always pro already provide this type of insurance. Uh, you can use the current GSE mortgage securization process with tighter underwriting standards and, sort, and pretty much get to what we're talking about. If you could move the current requirements, generally the idea that the borrower has a very good credit history and the equivalent of an 80% loan-to-value ratio to tighter requirements, something like borrowers with the equivalent of a 60% loan-to-value ratio, you can maintain most of the other components of the MBS market, and two, including the two, uh, the to be announced market, the TBA market, uh, and uh, and you would adopt some of the uh, positive features of a European type, type system that uh, Dwight mentioned. Uh, you'd greatly expand private market participation in the secondary mar mortgage market. The private market would be responsible for covering this very substantial first loss position. It would be some combination of down payments perhaps private mortgage insurance, perhaps some form of second loans, perhaps some form of junior bonds. You could do it in a lot of ways. The point is that the GSE guarantee, explicitly priced, would only cover the most catastrophic losses. And indeed, we have a suggested pricing rule for the GSEs if you were to have this FDIC-like entity. Uh, that the fee for the government guarantee, the so-called G fee, would be set so that during good economic times, a typical nationwide, profitable, well-capitalized, well-diversified bank would be indifferent between securitizing the mortgage using government-backed insurance and holding the mortgage on its balance sheet. Well, by good times, we mean non-recession periods, and uh, we would note that even during good times, you're likely to get uh, securitization of some mortgages by the banking system because the criteria laid out there are not met by many banks. Uh, and you continue to have mortgage bankers and brokers who would utilize the system to securitize. Uh, securitization also would likely increase in this sort of model when there was increased financial volatility or the prospect of an economic downturn. Now, another advantage of this idea is when you consider the current state of mortgage securitization, the question is how to get from here to there. Currently, almost all government securitization is government-backed securitization. Uh, private mortgage securitization is almost non-existent, and the situation seems unlikely to change in the foreseeable future. Furthermore, the reform of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac may take a very substantial amount of time. Explicit government guarantees foster financial stability and ensure that mortgage securitization is available under all markets. And indeed, the sort of reform we're discussing could be imposed through Treasury ownership. You'd have very limited GSE portfolios, already a goal of the Treasury ownership. And the government pricing rule that we suggest could be imposed uh, as a method to, uh, to implement GSE pricing of this MBS. And you'd have direct government control of the other GSE actions, the risk management, the compensation, the lobbying uh, would be under the Federal Housing Finance Agency's administration and Treasury oversight, as it is now. So, and to try to answer the question, is there a future for residential mortgage securitization? Well, <clears throat> we argue you're going to need some way for reform GSEs to provide mortgage-sensitive investors with a diversity of assets to purchase uh, as a way to remove their search for the implicit government backing. And this is the essence of what we perceive as the persistent of persistence of financial crisis. You have a system set up now where many, many people are guaranteed higher yields and no risk in a lot of different venues, and there's a constant search for implicit government backing. So, um, and that uh, basically Fannie and Freddie, May and Freddie Mac are being moved in this direction already by the actions of their regulator and the Treasury. By reducing the GSE portfolios and implementing reasonable pricing rules, the GSEs could be transformed into catastrophic mortgage insurers and it establishes a limited and needed role for government involvement in mortgage securitization until Congress can act um, on a, a broader program. So for the details of this proposal and the economic analysis that underlies it, uh, this fall a book came out, The Future of Housing Finance, Restructuring the U.S. Residential Mortgage Market, with Martin Bailey as the editor. It's a Brookings Institution press book. And we 
heartily recommend Chapter 6, Diana Hancock and Wayne Passmore, uh, Catastrophic Mortgage Insurance and the Reform of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, we've heard a little bit about a, a, a view from the perspective of the GOCs. We've heard a little bit from uh, inside the Federal Reserve System. We've heard from academia. Our next speaker is David Scharfstein from Harvard University. David spent some time advising uh, the Obama administration on these and other issues. And David, welcome. Well, thank you, and thanks for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, in this panel. I'm going to talk about um, a paper, also published in the book that uh, Wayne just uh, mentioned, um, about the um, uh, looking at the economics of uh, of housing finance um, reform. Uh, and so, what I'd like to do is um, kind of review some of the. Uh, the le what I consider to be the leading option, um, at least that, that has sort of broad um, support uh, in the financial community uh, amongst uh, uh, some economists um, and as well uh, folks at various think tanks. Um, the it, Obama administration came out with a white paper. Uh, there were three elements of that of that white paper. One was the notion that um, the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac should be wound down. Um, the second uh, is that we need better regulation of private mortgage uh, credit, uh, including new approaches to regulating securitization. Uh, and then the third piece was um, the white paper laid out three options. Uh, Dwight mentioned uh, those three. The first is just a kind of pure privatization model, although keeping the FHA uh, with its mandate. The second, the third, uh, was a broad-based private mortgage uh, guarantees with explicit priced government reinsurance of mortgage-backed securities. And that's uh, broadly along the lines of the model that, that, that Wayne uh, was discussing. And then option two lies somewhere in between privatization uh, and this broad-based uh, private mortgage guarantees, um, which is basically privatization, uh, where uh, private entities would be responsible for um, most of the uh, mortgage uh, origination and uh, credit risk. Um, so they have, the gov but the government would have, uh, so the government would basically be out of the, uh, of the market, except for a facility that could um, guarantee mortgages, uh, new mortgages, during a period um, of uh, significant financial stress in the system. Uh, and I want to lay out an argument for option two. Um, but first, I would like to uh, discuss some of the issues that I have with uh, option three. And I think it requires um, some, um, some discussion, uh, again, because it, 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 it has a fair amount of support uh, in various quarters. Um, the key objective, as I see it, of this, of this option, uh, which again is basically private entities like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, or could be banks, uh, would take first loss uh, on their uh, guarantees of mortgages. Uh, but in the event that those institutions that were making those guarantees failed, uh, the government would step in and guarantee legacy mortgage-backed securities that were guaranteed by these private entities. Uh, and I think the key objective of this uh, proposal is really to try to replicate as much as possible the current system. That is to create be able to create a security in which investors bear no credit risk. Uh, and there's an attempt to try to protect the government by charging those uh, entities that are doing the in the first loss position the reinsurance fee. So this, this is basically the model we had for Fannie and Freddie, except the private institutions would be uh, charged explicitly for reinsurance. Uh, 
Um, the advocates for this system often argue that the system uh, lowers mortgage-backed security yields, uh, creates a more liquid market, but implicit in many advocates for this, uh, I'm not sure where Wayne and Diana stand on this, I don't, I'm not sure that they would say this, uh, is that the government only charges for expected losses, that is the actuarially losses on the mortgage-backed securities, whereas the private sector also charges a risk premium as well. Uh, and so there's some notion that basically the government is a better risk bearer uh, than the private sector. I think public finance theory basically rejects that view uh, and says that if the, the government uh, is um, bearing systematic risk, modern finance theory I think rejects that view, then it should charge the same risk premium as the private sector. Um, note that the losses will, cur will occur as they did uh, in uh, the current crisis at a period where um, households are bearing significant losses uh, in their own portfolios and the government um, will have to cut back on, uh, have to tax them uh, to uh, meet these obligations. And so there are real losses in bad states of the world that um, the government should charge a risk premium for that as well. So I, we see the, um, the benefit of this uh, as, as being less in the fact that yields would be lower because the government should charge a lower risk premium. We think the government should charge the same risk premium. Um, but you could argue that a properly priced government reinsurance of mortgage-backed securities in normal times you could benefit from a liquidity, a small liquidity premium from the fact that you've got, you know, a very active and liquid uh, uh, market um, for uh, securities that have no real credit risk, but that benefits on the order of 10 to 20 basis points. Okay. Now, three main criticisms of this uh, approach. Uh, the first is that lowering MBS yields may not be effective in lowering mortgage rates for borrowers in normal times. I'll go into a little bit more detail about that. Second, lowering mortgage rates shouldn't really be the objective. Uh, and the third is that creating private entities that are backstopped by the government recreate some of the same moral hazard problems that we had uh, in the old system. So you know, the first chart over here just you know, graphs um, the, the green line is the, is the 30 year jumbo rate, so it's, it's not it's one that does not um, benefit from the, the guarantee. Uh, the, the, the dotted red line is the 30-year conforming mortgage rate, and you can see that those track each other extremely closely until the crisis. And the crisis kicks in, and you see a widening of the spreads between the jumbo uh, and the conforming. Um, so in normal times, we're, we're, we're not seeing much in the way of a benefit um, of, the, of the government guarantee. This is also the second picture just shows that, you know, you could be much more effective uh, in lowering rates for uh, homeowners um, by sort of dealing with issues around, you know, concentration in the mortgage market than you might be with um, trying to do guarantees on $5 trillion of mortgage-backed securities. What we're doing here is graphing, uh, you know, concentration uh, on um, the um, uh, basically on, on, on mortgage rates, and you see that, you know, as concentration goes up um, over time, uh, mortgage rates or mortgage spreads went up as well. So, um, again, this, so the, the, the notion that we're going to try to lower, um, we should guarantee $5 trillion worth of mortgages to lower MBS yields in normal times, I don't think is, um, we wouldn't say that that's um, the best idea. Um, lowering mortgage rates, again, we don't think should necessarily be the objective. Uh, housing investments already distorted by the mortgage interest deduction. Uh, it's also, we think, distorted by the relative uh, ease of financing hard assets over intangible assets. If there's any uh, asset in the world that would be easy to, um, uh, to, to finance, it's a, a hard collateralizable asset, it's a home. Uh, and so the notion that there's like a lot of government um, support for that particular, um, for financing that particular asset, seems to us to, to, to exacerbate already um, uh, distortions in uh, household investment. Third, um, creating private entities that are backstopped by the government just recreates some of the same moral hazard problems that we had uh, in the old system, okay? So, uh, you know, private entities are going to lobby for low reinsurance fees and capital requirements, low capital requirements, as well as a broad guarantee mandate just because you're charging them 
for a, a reinsurance doesn't mean that they're not going to try to expand their mandate and um, expand the, the, the government guarantee to a wider um, variety of, of mortgages. And this is already being played out in the debate over the definition of a qualified residential mortgage. The QRM, qualified residential mortgage, is the mortgage that would be exempted from the skin in the game regulation that Dwight was talking about earlier. And the same in the industry has basically lined up to say that if you require this skin in the game, um, if, you, if you define the, the, the QRM pretty narrowly um, to be, you know, 20 percent down um, type of mortgages, that this is going to really destroy, you know, mortgage markets uh, as we know it. And um, so it's, it's, I think, a precursor for the kinds of debates that we're going to see going forward with respect to what we do with the, with the GSEs. Our perspective is that um, what we really should be doing in thinking about housing finance reform is uh, not so much on how are we going to get you know, mortgage rates down 10 or 20 basis points, but thinking about it from the perspective of financial stability. That is, um, what, we, what we think we should be doing is that to, to reduce excessive volatility in the supply of housing credit and protect the financial system from ad adverse shocks to the housing market. That that seems like if we, if we think about what kind of housing finance policy would we want to have from the perspective of, um, uh, of, of financial stability. So possible objectives would be that you want to limit boom and bust cycles uh, in housing finance. Uh, we know that, you know, from uh, research that um, uh, Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhardt have done that uh, real estate um, uh, crises or real estate booms are a precursor to um, major financial crises that uh, have long-lasting impacts on the economy. So trying to limit boom and bust cycles in housing finance is important. Protecting the financial system from housing market collapse, possible other objective, and supporting housing finance when it's most needed, not during normal times, but during periods of significant financial stress, also seems like a reasonable objective. So what policies would, would deliver those objectives? Well, one, in limiting boom and bust cycles, you might want to think about regulating risky mortgage products and securitization. There should be bank capital and liquidity requirements that get rid of the sort of regulatory arbitrage that Dwight was talking about before, um, but protects, protect banks against, um, uh, against losses uh, during, significant losses during periods of, of financial stress. And then we argue that the potential role for a government guarantor of last resort for, importantly, newly issued mortgage-backed securities, that is to support housing finance when it's um, most needed. And, and, and Wayne talked about um, you know, the run on mortgage-backed securities and the collapse of the housing finance market uh, during the crisis. We think that argues less for guaranteeing existing or legacy mortgage-backed securities, but in supporting uh, new mortgage securitization, and that could potentially be done through a government agency. Okay, so I think that's a logic behind option two, that is regulated privatization with a government guarantor of last resort for newly issued mortgage-backed um, securities. Okay, so an important piece of this is privatization, but privatization with regulation. Okay. Um, now, you could ha if you have a pure financial stability objective, that can be achieved by strict underwriting standards. That is basically saying you can't borrow money unless you've got an LTV less than 80 percent or a debt to income ratio um, less than 28 percent. But we admit that this would potentially conflict with various other policy goals of ensuring widespread availability of mortgage credit. So there's a, there's a trade-off between financial stability and some other goals um, that, that folks might have. We think that there needs to be um, less focus on trying to replicate the existing system via government guarantees and more focus on thinking about how do we regulate um, private mortgage markets. And it, not to say that we have um, all of the answers, but components of this might include um, stricter bank capital and liquidity requirements on riskier mortgages. Um, you know, currently on the bank, bank uh, capital requirements don't really make much of a distinction between uh, relatively risky and safe mortgages that are on their balance sheets. Um, new regulatory approaches to securitization. I mean, a securitization is in some sense a mini bank. Uh, 
where the junior tranches you can think of as equity uh, and the senior tranches as, as, as debt financing. So I think we need, to, we need to think about how you regulate that. That could be um, limits on the securitization of risky mortgages. It could include limits on the size of senior tranches. Uh, we saw a, you know, credit rating agencies not doing their job. There may be some role for government regulation there. Limits on resecuritization, um, CDOs, for example, uh, and standardization of securitization to promote liquidity and safety. That is, can we get things like a TBA market? Can we get a liquid market for mortgage-backed securities without government guarantees? And how do we think about designing a system um, like that? Seems, seems important. The government guarantor of last resort, in a way, um, FHA um, played a bit of this role, which is that you know, FHA's market share shrank dramatically uh, during the boom. And then during the crisis, as um, borrowers, uh, homeowners had a difficult time funding themselves, they went to, um, to the FHA a government agency to, to the fund themselves. And of course, they also went to, um, to Fannie and Freddie. Fannie and Freddie's ability to do this was only made possible by the fact that the government stepped in and put the, the, the agencies into, sorry, put Fannie and Freddie into conservatorship without government support. They wouldn't have been able to do this. Our idea is that we want to provide support in periods of financial stress via a government-owned corporation that would guarantee newly issued mortgage-backed securities. Probably in order to do that, you have to maintain some uh, capability during normal times, and so that should be limited, um, but there's an opportunity to, to ramp it up during periods of significant stress. Um, and we think that, that if we're going to do this, it should be government ownership uh, to reduce moral hazard. That is, we don't want to mix um, private entities um, with a government backstop. That if the government's involved in guaranteeing it, that it should actually be government ownership. And again, if you look at the FHA, FHA did not chase um, the chase market share during uh, the boom times, and that's because they had low-powered incentives. We want an agency that's going to have low-powered incentives and would be limited by regulation to have uh, a low market share during normal times. It would just basically be a, back, a, a facility that could ramp up during, um, uh, during a crisis. Uh, in the interest of time, let me just conclude by saying that you know, leading policy proposals um, envision government reinsurance of mortgage-backed securities. We think that that's just a recipe for repeating some of the problems we've had um, over the last five years. Um, you know, and the, uh, the, the, the benefits of government guarantees occur mainly during a crisis. Um, and we have some work that we're doing right now that suggests that there's evidence of smaller house price declines uh, and lower foreclosure rates in areas where the GSEs and, uh, um, have had greater um, guarantee capability. And so this suggests a policy of limited government guarantees in normal times, uh, increased use of guarantees on newly issued MBS in a crisis, and we have to think harder about how we regulate um, the private mortgage markets. So thank you. David, thank you very much. Our uh, final panelist this morning before we break open for some Q&A is uh, Professor Susan Wachter from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Susan, as many of you know, also served as Deputy Secretary at HUD uh, during the Clinton administration. And Susan, welcome. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here to provide my, uh, my views on the future of the residential mortgage securitization markets and to follow the thoughtful comments of my fellow panelists. Uh, clearly, the system failed, uh, not just the private label securitization, but Fannie and Freddie as well. And while securitization has come back to other markets, including credit cards, asset-backed securitization, Private securitizations come back to these markets also to commercial mortgage-backed securities, as I detail in a paper with colleague uh, Adam Levitin. There is no private label securitization going on right now, as uh, Frank Notaft points out. So I will uh, 
in my comments today detail the challenges in bringing back private residential mortgage-backed securitization. I will then review briefly the options that have been put forth by Congress and administration. And I will note that there is a missing piece in these proposals that I think is critical for the future viability of a private component to MBS. Um, and I will also briefly, very briefly, review what got us here, even though obviously there's a great deal of disagreement on that. So the challenges to uh, mortgage-backed securitization going forward, either private or consensus on public, is that, for one, there is no consensus on, as this panel clearly points to, on where we go forward. Currently, there is nearly 100% reliance on the federalized system, and the current market conditions are fragile. And this fragility has some, everything to do with transition to new systems. The shadow supply of housing, as we all know here, is very large, and there's a potential for negative feedback effects since today's prices depend on future price expectations, and this depends on the availability of financing and finance systems going forward. Thus, the lack of consensus on a future system is part of the uncertainty of today's markets. And as you have heard, of course, there is lack of consensus. There's also, given the uh, rescue of both the private and the public uh, sectors, increase moral hazard, arguably, going forward, despite the protestations of Dodd-Frank to the contrary. And I will focus on what I think is a key problem going forward. Oops, what did I just do? Have that. Thank you. Uh, is uh, information failures in this market that hasn't been solved. But in order to do, to do that, I do want to step back momentarily uh, on an autopsy of what has happened. Now, I think that obviously there are literally tens, twenties, hundred paper perhaps, in many in uh, the ASS meetings this, uh, that, we've just, that we're ending now today uh, on the causes of the crisis. But what is true in the causes of this crisis and booms and busts across many countries is a coincident double boom, a boom not only in prices, but a boom in credit. Leaving aside issues of causality, although there are papers that address causality, one by my uh, colleague and myself, Adam Levitin, and others, uh, let me just note that the coincident boom of volume of lending and prices is, and by the way, what we see here is prices relative to rents and the boom of credit. This, this collinearity, this correlation is not uh, emphasize not, is not sufficient as an indicator of a bubble. Nonetheless, it is important to track what has happened to the volume of lending and particularly the quality of lending. And in this period, the quality of lending, of course, as we all now know, deteriorated sharply. And the key point that I want to make uh, in uh, pointing to these uh, data on mortgage credit conditions is that this is not known real time. Uh, the increase in uh, uh, low doc, that is Alt A, the increase in interest only, the increase in subprime, the increase in subprime and Alt A um, was not known concurrently. Uh, by the way, interestingly enough, there was a refi uh, boom, prime boom, prior to the boom in non-prime arms, uh, which says something perhaps about the um, uh, institutional reasons why this occurred, which I've written about, but we'll leave that aside. But the important point is leaving aside the volume, because the volume alone is not, again to emphasize, sufficient to indicate a bubble in asset prices as a cause. But what is extremely important to track is the price of risk. And in this period, as the quality, the underwriting quality deteriorated, the price of risk also declined relative to treasuries and relative to corporates. This is in a paper by 
uh, colleague Adam Levitan and, and myself that's forthcoming. Now, getting this data is not available real time, and it was extremely difficult to do it after the fact. So uh, that, to start with, is really the point. The point is that information on the part of regulators and investors on the book of business and the pricing of the book of business and the consistency between these two is simply not available. Now, the data we have here is itself problematic because what we're looking at is the volume of lending versus the pricing of lending relative to treasuries and corporates based on Moody's rating. So we're looking at MBS, private label MBS, pricing of risk, but we're using the rating agencies AAA and B, and of course that too is in question, as we know. So, the question of how do we deal with this information failure is not answered sufficiently by simply saying, going forward, we will have suitable mortgages. Because this problem is not a problem just in the US. We have mortgage booms and banking booms, and it's not just a, as uh, Dwight very well pointed out, it's absolutely not just a securitization problem, it's a banking problem. And we have real estate booms and banking crashes historically in markets without securitization. The data problem is therefore pervasive, and it's not just a U.S. problem, as the, uh, cra the crashes in uh, Ireland, Spain, and the U.K. point out. So what do we do in terms of going forward? We have government proposals in the Treasury White Paper that came out in February this year that have uh, been gone through um, uh, briefly by many of the people on the panel, so I won't uh, spend uh, time here. And we also have congressional proposals. And the congressional proposals cover the waterfront, uh, but indeed there is some consensus that is building. Uh, there is uh, disagreement, however, on, uh, and, and the consensus that I would say that is forming is certainly in the short run a need to rely on government uh, guarantees as priced explicitly for part of the market or a utility approach which is basically a government owned uh, entity uh, which again obviously has government backing in the short run and the potential move to private label securitization in the longer run. But the question for all of these, the missing component that I would argue, for both a public and a private system is the role of information. So from my uh, perspective, comprehensive reform requires a new focus, a focus that's missing on standardization of mortgage products, transparency in the securitization market, TBA pools and liquidity not only for liquidity but also for standardization, and most important, improve real-time information flow to investors and regulators that would come out of structured data. One question that has not been asked in this question, let alone answered, is what is the need for long-term fixed-rate mortgages? Because without the need for long-term fixed-rate mortgages, then we really do not need to be talking about a mortgage-backed securitization system. But I would argue we still need to be talking about data and information availability. So uh, we have a paper um, called this, Rise, Fall, and Return of the Public Option in Housing and Finance. And uh, what um, Professor Sharfstein had just uh, laid out is our potential uh, future. That is a move uh, eventually to a, um, uh, to a private system where the public system would come in only in crises is in fact what we've had. Uh, starting with the housing finance in the Great Depression, and then uh, public option, which is what the New Deal was. And then, of course, we had the decline of that. And uh, then again, we have the public option again. But of course, we did this in a very unintentional way, in a way which brought crisis to the entire economy. I would hope that we'd be more thoughtful going forward. And I think this panel conversation helps us in that regard. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, wonderful. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we do have a few minutes left together for purposes of a, a joint and collective conversation on these issues. What I'll do is uh, perhaps warm the panel up a bit with, with a particular question, and, and I would, would look to your input as well. And, and, and I would phrase my question as, as follows to, to my colleagues up here in the panel. Uh, we, we currently have a system we don't want. We have a system that is essentially uh, uh, public provision, public securitization, and lack of private sector involvement with respect to any secondary or derivative market activity whatsoever. Uh, Frank, of course, provided data to this point. We seek, as uh, Dwight and others have suggested, the reemergence of uh, the private sector for private securitization for covered bonds and all the rest. And we're knowledgeable, all of us, uh, being faithful citizens, of the fact that we are currently entering an election season, that we have uh, virtual <laughs> political gridlock, that we have very eloquent proposals for futures that relate to mortgage finance, and we have the expectation that virtually uh, nothing will be done of consequence between now and the election. So my question to the panel is uh, short run, long run. Uh, gentlemen and Susan, what's going to happen in the next year? Is anything going to happen in the next year that is going to move us uh, markedly uh, towards our goal of private sector involvement in mortgage finance, or are we just kind of spinning until the first 90 days of the next administration? Dwight. So um, when I made my presentation, I answered the question. This time I'm going to take advantage, because I have one comment on my panelists, so I'm not going to answer your question. I'm going to answer mine, um, which is, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a point that was made by all three of the panelists to my right which was to suggest that the uh, current fragility or inactivity in the private uh, label securitization market motivated a role for government. And I do believe they're misinterpreting that information, that data, for two reasons. Uh, first and foremost, it's just an example of crowding out. Uh, the Treasury and the Fed have purchased more than a trillion dollars of GSE mortgage-backed securities. The Treasury has put $150 billion of capital into the GSEs, and to think that the private label firms are going to be able to compete with a highly subsidized, actually, government agency is, is really unfair to, to uh, you can't use that to answer the question, what would the private label securitization markets look in the absence of that? Um, uh, so uh, my point is that, that there's really no information uh, 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 in that. Um, what, what a second point that, that is, and, and while it's evident once I say it, I haven't seen anyone else point it out, Close to 85% of all the GSE activity in the last two years has been refinancing. They are doing very little new home purchase mortgage making. In fact, the private markets are making more home purchase mortgages uh, than the GSEs are. The GSEs are doing all the refinancing as part of the uh, HAMP and HARM and, and all these other government programs. But the fact is they're not making new mortgages. And so that uh, my, my key point is that the, there's no evidence here, and I, I actually do think absent a crowding out effect, the private markets would be alive and well. One other quick comment is I actually agree with both David and Wayne that if we could have a true catastrophe government backstop, government guarantee program that wasn't in the front of the uh, risk pool but was at the very back end as a catastrophe, I actually have no trouble with those. My concern is that there are government insurance programs almost inevitably start off with those good intentions and they end up uh, being first loss national flood insurance programs that suddenly realize uh, that they, they owe 20 billion dollars because of uh, Katrina that they never thought would happen. So I agree with you guys in principle on a government backstop but I, I just don't think it's a practical. Sorry but that I said my piece. <laughs> you got it, you got it. Uh, anyone else on the panel? Are we going to get anywhere in the next year? Uh, is, is there anything uh, Anything we can do, Wayne, that, that is not, not in the realm of the administration or in the realm of Congress that you think will, will push us towards this goal? Anything you, you see coming down the pike here? Uh, in the next year, I think it's pretty unlikely that you're going to see uh, much more than discussions, hearings, uh, additional bills, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I think it's unlikely you're going to get 
any sort of, of uh, action that's, that's going to really change the nature of securitization that we have right now. Uh, in the longer run, I think, um, uh, <laughs> I think that, and I actually, this, yeah, I, I think Dwight and I are, are in agreement about the various problems and difficulties of catastrophic insurance, but I think we're in disagreement about the crowding out effect. Uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, I don't see uh, evidence of significant private sector interest in recreating private market uh, securitization. And uh, I think the uncertainty about that under longer run is making it very difficult to assemble uh, any institutional structure with private investors that can handle any significant volume of mortgages. I agree with uh <clears throat> I agree with uh, Wayne's comments, and of course there are jumbo mortgages that are being made that are on uh, banking books, but there are uh, no private label securitizations that have taken off in the residential side, unlike the commercial side. There have been attempts. There have been two attempts, and the industry uh, that on the private sector that are attempting to do this are calling for standards, and I do before they can they believe go forward and get investors to come to the game, and I do think that there is room in this next period for consensus building among private sector entities to come to standards that could be supported going forward in the long run as we evolve into a new system. Okay, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to get the panel to answer one more question and then I'm gonna open it up to all of you. But, but the question I'm gonna ask is the question I started with in my remarks and it's the following question. If, if you look to statements of Bill Clinton during his uh, two administrations. If you look to statements during, uh, of, of George Bush, with respect to the home ownership goal, you see very bold, very significant statements. It's hard to tell who's the Democrat and who's the Republican with respect to the importance of the pursuit of home ownership as an overarching policy goal in the United States of America. And you see, of course, the entire umbrella of, again, policy, regulation, tax, et cetera, that is consistent with that objective. Uh, I'm not sure who I should ask this question to, maybe to David, but I think we've got the facts on the ground. And the facts on the ground is that we had this grand experiment with home ownership, and we created uh, some permanent home ownership and a lot of transitory home ownership, a lot of home ownership failure, and a lot of pain associated with home ownership failure. And it's hard for any of us to argue collectively as a group that we did a lot of people a lot of good with respect to these transitory experiences in home ownership where the home ownership rate goes from 69% to back to the 66, maybe to the 64% range. So the question is as follows. Is, is, is anyone gonna have the political guts to stand up in front of the American people and say, you know what, maybe we should adjust the bias in policy that relates to tenure choice in the United States of America. I don't have a, I don't have a lot of insight into you know politics or who's you know who has the guts to say what. Um, I do think I mean I do think you're right, which is that um, if you think about the policy from a kind of more general equilibrium perspective, we got the mortgage interest deduction, um, you know, uh, subsidized mortgage rates. Uh, it is not obvious that kind of in equilibrium, the beneficiaries of that have been households. Um, that, you know, basically it bids up the prices of homes and makes them in a way less affordable. The expanding, you know, ability of folks to borrow with, you know, 3% down, I mean, has effects in markets. We know, I, I, I believe that to be the case. And I don't think that, uh, you know, we moved from 65 to 69% in terms of home ownership and uh, homes became less affordable. Um, so, you know, whether anyone has the guts to, to, to say that, I don't, I, I'm not really sure, but that's why, you know, in our proposal, we're less focused on trying to lower rates and, and, and uh, because I think at the end of the day, you're sort of, um, you know, you're chasing your, you're chasing your tail. I want to say one thing, which is that if you look at the growth of, um, the financial sector over the last 30 years and you ask what, um, what is it actually delivered to end users, corporations, and households? The big growth in the financial sector has been in terms of household credit over the last 30 years. It's corporate credit to GDP hasn't gone up that much, but household credit to GDP has gone up a lot. And that means that people are borrowing more for it to, to finance consumption. 
and to finance uh, housing. And again, not clear that it's uh, been hugely beneficial to, uh, to, to the household sector. Okay, thank you. Dwight. Yeah, I, I would say it's actually not a problem, um, and, and that the nature will take its course, and that w as the evidence I already pointed out is our home ownership rate with all our government programs is effectively the same as 16 European countries without any government intervention. So the absence of government intervention isn't going to make it any worse. Um, and I would actually suggest, uh, with, with deference to my colleague to the left, that without the GSEs around, we won't be having advertisements saying uh, the American dream, not Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae. Uh, uh, and so I think it's going to become a non-issue. We'll just remove a lot of the subsidies, and we'll say nothing much happened because they didn't do much, so they, removing them won't do much. Well, I guess my reference, is, uh, Dwight, is... Uh you know, we, we have a long-term equilibrium with respect to the home ownership rate, and that long-term equilibrium is in this nature of, say, 64, 66 yeah. percent. My concern is with not only the bubble in house prices or the bubble in, in, in whatever, but the bubble in home ownership. And, and we, but, we've but taken all... Off. Right. We've taken the air out of that bubble, but, but uh, you know, that's, that, that was a policy problem. Mm -hmm. Frank, Frank, did you want to get in here? Well, the uh, national home ownership rate is a very uh, simple metric. I think it's an overly simple metric, and it's not really the right metric to look at. Um, if you look at a, at a life cycle, you see that over time, and this has been true for many, many years, uh, more than 80% of all households become homeowners at some point in their life. Now, the national home ownership rate is just a real simple metric, just uh, doesn't account for these life cycle effects. Mm -hmm. You can increase the national home ownership rate by getting people into home ownership earlier in their life cycle. That doesn't necessarily uh, help them in terms of maintaining uh, home ownership over time. And I think the right objective is to make sure that when uh, the home ownership opportunities become available for a household, you put them in a situation where they can be successful and maintain home ownership over time. So if that's at a home ownership rate that's a, a national home ownership rate that's a little bit lower, that's fine. If we're successful in maintaining home ownership once it's achieved, I think the desire for home ownership probably hasn't changed much over a long period of time. It may not change much over in the future either for individual households over their life cycle. But that's also consistent with a national home ownership rate that may be lower than what it has been. Absolutely. Well, okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's your turn to get involved in this conversation. We have tremendous resources up here. Uh, yes, sir. I mean, I have a position on it, but I, I'm not sure it's what you're looking for. So what the, the, the European markets have had almost no foreclosure problems. And so you might say, well, what have they done that we haven't done? And the answer is they basically have recourse on all their mortgages, which is to say a borrower who signs on to a Spanish mortgage or a Swedish mortgage is committed to make those payments, uh, and they cannot simply drop off the keys at the uh, bank and thereby be rid of their um, uh, commitment. It's a lifetime commitment, in effect. And, and so I would think that if I were redesigning the U.S. private mortgage market, I would want a, a menu which would give borrowers the choice of saying, I want a recourse mortgage. Uh, in other words, you, I, I'm committed to make the payments come hell or high water. And, but I want the 50 or 75 basis points reduction in the mortgage rate that comes with that, uh, or I, 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 I don't want recourse. I want to have the right to throw the key back to you, and, but I'm, and I'm willing to pay for it. So my solution for it is, is to allow recourse uh, to become a, a, a viable option in the U.S. mortgage markets. Okay, great, wonderful. Uh, question number two, I think uh, Danny Kwan, and we'll get to you. Uh, and Danny, I think we need, uh, we need you up here at the microphone. <laughs> 
concerns about helping the CMPS market will, will rebound because the graph that Frank showed in terms of the link to default, you can easily say the same thing about commercial mortgages. So there's a considerable amount of parallels in the two. And, and I guess the bottom line is that uh, I'd like to hear what the panel's uh, prediction regarding what the CMPS market is going to go forward. Let me know. Sure. So, and this actually, I, my answer in part also uh, in addition to the first question. So to me, there is the, the fundamental difference between a residential mortgage market and a commercial mortgage market from a lender standpoint and from a loan workout standpoint is that it's, it's relatively easy to work out a commercial mortgage. The, 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 the building owner comes into the bank and says, my building is half filled. I have 50% vacancy. Here's the role. You can see how much rental income I have and says to the bank, either you work out my mortgage, you revise the payment schedules because here's the money that's available or the building is yours. And if you want to run a big commercial building, have, have fun. And the banks typically quickly will work out those mortgages. In fact, right now we have a huge amount of, of loan workouts in the commercial mortgage market and it goes very smoothly. This doesn't work in residential mortgages because the bank looks in the eyes of that borrower and they have no idea whether the borrower has the ability really to repay and they're just trying to get a cheap workout. And the banks also know that if they give a workout to, to borrower A, borrower B down the street who's currently current on his mortgage is going to say whatever it takes to become in, not current, count me in. And so the banks have a, it's a much, much more complex problem to rework uh, residential mortgages than it is the objective facts of commercial mortgages. So I think that's the fundamental uh, 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 difference. I'd make one other comment. And this, this is again to the point that the inactivity in the residential mortgage market is not a, a symptom of a failure of that market, is that it, all the other asset-backed securitization markets, the commercial ones, they're all working just fine. So if there is a problem in the residential mortgage market, it's in the mortgage contract or it's in the lack that no one's making home mortgages, so of course no one's securitizing them. So uh, I actually think that there is a lot to be learned from the commercial mortgage-backed securities market and particularly on the information uh, requirements for these markets to work. Uh, I do agree uh, with um, uh, the point that uh, has just been made by Dwight that it's much easier to resolve crises in a commercial market, very simply because income comes from the property and not from the borrower. And if you're in a crisis, then uh, the macroeconomic implications will be that there will be not only a problem in LTV, which of course is the case for both commercial and residential, but there will be employment shocks as well, as well as the difficulties in uh, moral hazard. But that said, it is very interesting that we had a price rise in CMBS that actually, uh, a price rise in, in commercial, CRE, that was actually higher price, boom and bust, than in residential, and there was an equivalent credit boom and bust in the CMBS market. And as I said, I have a paper on this with Adam Levitin that, is, uh, that I'm currently writing, just about to come out. But what is interesting is that market, the CMBS market was working just fine when B-piece owners, uh, quote, quote, unquote, so-called so B-piece owners, were holding the risk and could analyze the relatively few number of deals that would be in a CMBS mortgage because obviously the size of the assets are so much larger. Where that market became quite troubled was when the B piece was substituted by the CDOs, which then uh, were product out for the financial sector and had some of the same problems as CDOs in the residential side. CMBS is coming back, and it's coming back with BPs, just as it worked for many years. Of course, CDOs is not coming back, and I would argue the reason CDOs are not coming back, derivatives are not coming back in general, in the residential side or in the CMBS side, is a lack of standardization information. Okay. One thing that uh, hasn't been discussed yet is the fate of MERS. Uh, in order to have securitization work, we need, to make, we need to have a very efficient system for transferring mortgages and keep track of who actually owes what to whom. So I'd love to hear what the panelists think, uh, A, should happen with MERS, and B, what will happen with MERS. I can go for it. Uh, I'm not speaking for myself, but my colleague Nancy Wallace. 
who is uh, re writing a paper right now on the legal implications of the failure of MERS. Maybe I should take one second to explain to the audience. Uh, uh, so um, it's a legal issue that when a, a uh, mortgage owner wants to foreclose on the property, they have to go in front of some sort of a judicial procedure. And that judicial procedure usually requires that they not only have what's the note, the promise of the borrower to make the payments, but the collateral document, which is literally called the mortgage, that says uh, if you don't pay on the note, then you get then the whoever's holding these pieces of paper uh, get to foreclose. Problem is that in, in the midst of the boom, all the major lenders, including the GSEs, but all the major banks that are making mortgages, were transferring these mortgages around uh, uh, 10 times in a day sometimes. And it got really clumsy to keep tracking all this physical paper. And so they, they created a nonprofit entity, they, they're the joint owners, called MERS. And the idea was we'll put all the paperwork inside MERS. And when, when Bank of America buys a mortgage from Fannie or Freddie, uh, we don't have to go to the county clerk's office and change the ownership on the books of Alameda County. Uh, we'll just tell MERS we've agreed to change it, and it'll keep circulating this way. And they, they never worried about what would happen if the mortgages went bad and they had to foreclose. And as long as nothing bad happened, they kept their books accurately, and they were all operating in good faith, and it was fine. The day these mortgages started to go bad, uh, whoever was holding that bad mortgage that morning went in front of the judge and he said, where is the mortgage? Where is the collateral document? Well, MERS has it. It turned out MERS didn't have it either. The paperwork was done terribly sloppily and they still can't clean it up. And so that's the source of the problem. It's actually part of an even bigger problem, if I can take one more minute, which is the sort of uh, piping. This is the infrastructure of the US mortgage market. As you probably all know, in the stock markets, every equity security has a QSIP a number, and, and if you buy and sell it fundamentally in the back office, it's not ABC company, it's QCIP number X24, and that's how they keep track of it and transfer it all. There are no comparable numbers for mortgages. Uh, so my mortgage is, sits inside some mortgage-backed security, but there's no way of identifying it by number. And so when these things start to get transferred, the mortgages get completely lost. And anyone who's trying, any investor who's trying to do a serious valuation of these instruments, and you want to sort of do it from the grassroots mortgage by mortgage, it's almost hopeless because we have no tracking system. And it's a parallel problem to MERS. And so we, at least at UC Berkeley and with Nancy Wallace, have a major project which basically is to rework the, the, the piping of the U.S. mortgage market from the ground up, and we're having cooperation from the GSEs and from all the major banks, so they all realize there's a problem. Uh, but it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite amazing how poor the infrastructure actually is. And if I may, that's exactly what was needed. That kind of serious valuation cannot be done without information, without QCIP type numbers. And that is the beginnings of a structure of information system. There is a new office of uh, research, financial research OFR, at right? OFR, which is absolutely working on this. And um, I. I am surprised, uh, with the exception I'm, I'm working on, Nancy's working on it, at the few number of uh, real estate people who are involved. I think there need to be more real estate people involved as we redo this, uh, the, the structure of the system. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, please uh, join me in thanking our very excellent panel. Thank you very much.